Well, good morning, church. Hope everybody has dried out as much as they could over the past couple of days. And uh, I know that uh, we're trying to at, at our house, uh, dealing with a couple of leaks and a flooded pool. But outside of that, we're blessed. Amen. And uh, I'm glad that you have braved the weather today to, uh, to come out this morning. You know, many people will get into deer stands, not even think twice about it. But man, you come out on a day like today and a lot of people say, ooh, I don't think I can make it to church. So you are to be commended for coming and being here this morning. We're going to uh, continue in our series on who needs Christmas. And uh, we're talking today in the Advent season about peace. It was Wayne Dyer who said, simply put, you believe that things or people make you unhappy, but this is not accurate. You make yourself unhappy. And it was Marcus Aurelius who said, very little is needed to make a happy life. It's all within yourself, in your way of thinking. So today I want to talk to you about peace. And uh, Henrik Edberg in his blog on positivity wrote about seven small habits that will steal your peace. And I thought he did a pretty good job on this. First is going for a daily swim in a sea of negative voices. We live in a time now where everybody has a platform. And most people in their platform, they're not very positive. In fact, with social media today, people will actually tell you what they're thinking if you just uh, know how to poke them the right way. Give them a little bit of time, follow them for a little while, you'll know what their agenda is. And he says, look, if, if you want to have peace in your life, you're going to have to quit swimming around in all that negativity. He said, instead of that, root out all of the negative in your life. And that may include people. There may be people in your life that, listen, you... You call them and you know when you call them that you don't have what it takes to stay positive because they're negative people, they're negative influences. I call it a toxic relationship. And uh, it could be not that, it could be uh, a workplace situation, it could be some kind of something going on at your school or whatever it is. He says, listen, root out the negative and stick with the positive things in your life. Second thing is waiting for just the right time. A lot of people are sitting around still waiting and waiting and waiting for just the right time to do whatever it is that you have dreamed to do. And he says, make things easy for yourself. You don't have to take a big leap. Just take the first small step of faith and get moving. Third, he says, letting criticism get under your skin time and time again. I know that a lot of us struggle with that. We say, man, I'm not going to let that person affect me anymore. Anybody have that in their life? Yeah, there's about 10 of us. The rest of you, you're lying. But, uh, but yeah, there's, there's people that, man, their criticism, you know where it's coming from. My mom always would tell me, consider the source. If the source is somebody who loves God and loves you, then you know that source is positive. But if either one of those are out, then you just delete that source. And you let them talk, let them say what they need to say, but don't focus on it too much. He says here, talk it over with a trusted friend to get perspective because a trusted friend will tell you, you know, well, there is some positive in what they're saying. There's some things maybe that you do need to adjust in your life, but they can also validate for you. And he says, uh, it's not always about you. You know, I've told you many times in here that hurting people hurt people. And nine times out of 10, a lot of what you deal with in negative comments towards you really aren't about you. You're just the object of that negative uh, comment. So number four, he says, focusing on the wrong people and getting lost in envy and powerlessness. He says, when you spend too much time in your day thinking about what other people have and do, and you compare your life to theirs, then you have a good recipe for unhappiness. He said, instead, focus on you. Focus on yourself. Compare yourself to yourself. See how far you've come. See the little steps you take. Celebrate the big steps you've taken in your life. Because at the end of the day, you have control over the choices that you make. And appreciate that. He says, not allowing yourself times of peace and rest during your day. And I'm concerned about that for all of us. When you are busy, busy, busy all the time. And you give yourself no time to recharge, then you soon become fatigued. I think that we live in a day, I was going to watch a study. There's a study out now that they're doing on the brain of teenagers and what technology, how technology has rewired their brains. I knew that. But um, 
how it how it has created within them some disconnects like when I was a youth pastor I I poked fun at kids all the time and you probably see this too Sherry as a teacher Uh, and I would I would poke hard and it was part of our sense of humor and it's one of the things kids liked about me now today they get offended because they don't have a sense of humor they don't really understand are you really seriously saying that about me or are you just kidding and I've noticed that with with my kids and it's taking all the fun out of my my jovial lifestyle you know I'm having to change what I what I do to try to be funny with people because they're just too serious and I think it's because they see mounds and mounds and mounds of information about what things ought to be for their lives that they don't have well remind yourself that you need to take a break every day and he says not only take a break every day but take a break every week God's given it to you and you're taking it today on this Lord's day to just break away from the world I think it's so important you know if people say well I don't need the church to have Jesus in my life, I'm like, man, you must have some kind of recipe for something in your life. I don't. I need a day in my week where I get with God's people, get away from this world, and get around singing praises to God, praying with my brothers and sisters in Christ, and hearing the word preached. I need that in my life, and I hope you see that too, and that's why you're here today. You know, he says, even in your month, one thing I started with our staff is, I'm, uh, I'm having every one of our ministers on staff take a day each month as a retreat day but it's a retreat day to get along with God and to just spend that day with God in his word in devotion and in prayer and uh, seeking him for not only their personal life but for their ministry I'm gonna tell you it makes a difference when you look at your month and you say I'm just gonna take a day and I'm gonna hang out with God and see what God can do in my life with that one day well you get the idea He says another reason people have their their joy stolen is they never try anything new. Do you know people like that? Never try anything new. He says remind yourself of past times when you did and you lived through it. And he says say yes just once this week when your mind says no. And then the seventh thing is taking things too seriously. When you take life too seriously then it... It's easy to become so afraid of making a mistake, he says, and stumbling that you get the paralysis of analysis. And what you need to do, he says, instead to have peace in your life is surround yourself with the lighter side of life. I'm not one of those people that likes dramatic movies because I live in drama every day as a pastor with people's lives and their stories. So I want comedy movies. If we go in to watch a movie, I I won't see something that's going to make me laugh and uh, that's hard to do because now people think to for it to be something that you would laugh at it'd be off color so it's hard to find but man I'm telling you I don't want to do that I was telling my brother-in-law last night um, I said a lot of times I get with people and they think all I want to talk about is Jesus and the church that's the only subject that I have in my subject matter because I'm a pastor is Jesus and the church I said I deal with the church seven days a week when I get with people I want to be a real person right I want to talk about the things that that other people talk about. I want to make fun of my kids. I want to talk about, you know, what Sharon and I are doing in our lives. And and I want to talk about, you know, hobbies that we have. I want to talk about the other person in their life. And and a lot of times people don't understand that. And you have the things in your life that you feel like every time people get with me, they think they need to talk to me about this subject. And there's a whole lot more to me than that subject. You've got to learn to laugh about yourself. Well, this Advent... We're in a series, obviously, where a lot of people say, who needs Christmas? You know, I'll I'll be honest with you. Thanksgiving week is when we normally put up our Christmas tree. And when I married Sharon, I married into Claus's family. um, My in-laws even have um, decorations on the toilet in the bathroom. So, I mean, it's it's Feliz Navidad everywhere. I think they have three trees in their house uh, because one's not enough. And I didn't grow up that way. I grew up with a little metallic tree in the corner, and uh, it was really kind of sad. Uh, but, um, but Christmas was good. Christmas was good. It was just we didn't decorate that much for Christmas. And, and I'll be honest with you, because Thanksgiving week was full, and we were all over the place. We don't, we don't really have our Christmas tree up yet. Normally, we have stuff in the yard. It's not out there yet because I, I was too lazy to swim through the backyard. Uh, to go get the decorations and put them up over my head and and if I don't do it my sons definitely aren't going to do it so um, you know we 
we just have not gotten there yet. And I've, Sharon and I were on the way to, to church today, and we have an elderly couple that lives on our, on our street. And she said, you know, I noticed they don't have their wreaths up this year. And she said, I wonder, you know, I just wish we had more time that we could go down there and put them up for them. Because I guarantee you it's because they just can't, they just can't get to it. It's not because they wouldn't want to do it. Uh, it's because where they are in their life, they just can't do. Well, you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes with life, we just say, who needs Christmas? But I want to say to you today, as you take out your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 16, that you may have peace in your life. You can have peace in your life. You may be sitting here today and you say, Brother Aaron, you don't know what I'm going through. Listen, I've heard some stories this week that, that do challenge the ability to focus on Christmas. There's some folks in this room that are dealing with a lot of heavy stuff in your life. And you're saying, man, Christmas is the furthest thing from my mind. And uh, I want to say to you, there's a word from the Lord today that, you, that says to you, you can have peace in your life, and I hope that you discover it this morning. Will you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? We're looking in John chapter 16, 31 through 33. Jesus has been talking to his disciples. He's preparing them for his death. And right at the end of uh, chapter 16, after this, 17, 18, 19, it goes right into his crucifixion. So here at the end of his life, as he talks to these disciples, he says, he answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace." In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Father, today, through the reading of your word, may your Holy Spirit inspire us, encourage us. And Lord, I pray all across this room, we'll focus on the word peace over these next minutes that we're together. So that God, your spirit can speak to us and apply your peace to the areas in our lives where we desperately need it. We pray this in Jesus' name by faith. All God's people said, you may be seated. You may be seated. I want to show you three areas that you can have peace. The first one is you may have peace in the will of God. You may have peace in the will of God. Jesus talking to his disciples here in this passage. He says, listen, now you believe because I've stopped speaking in parables. And I've just pretty much spelled it out for you what you're supposed to be about what's going to happen and how you need to respond so he asked the question you now believe me do you now believe me now that I've made it plain for you what is going to happen with my life and how you're going to need to respond but he says listen a time is coming and it is here already that you're going to leave me you're going to leave me all alone now I want to say to you, Jesus is a great example for us to follow because Jesus experienced things that helps us know that he can get down in the dirty with us. He can get right down in the muck and the mire with us because he lived it in his own life. And I want to say to you, you may have peace in the will of God. It was the will of God for Jesus to die alone on a tree for the sins of the world. It was that last big challenge for Jesus. That no one's going to walk with him. All of these 12 men that he spent all this time with. Imagine you going through a thing in your life. And some of you feel like you have. You've gone through something in your life. Your entire connect group disconnected from you. They didn't check on you. You didn't know what was going on. It's hurt your feelings. I know I've talked to people about that. It's like they didn't even know what was going on in my life. Now, I also have learned out here in Swartz that sometimes that's a one-way street. We've got people that, that feel like everybody in my connect group disconnected from me, and I ask the powerful question, well, who did you call to let them know you were going through it? Well, nobody, but they should know. Well, you know, Jesus knows, but... I wouldn't put anybody on the Jesus level. I know there's people that think pastors because they work for Jesus and they pray to Jesus. Jesus gives them the agenda, tells them who all needs him. But that's really not the way it works down here on earth. We have to connect both ways. But in this passage, he says, look, there's something about to happen to me and none of you, all of you are going to run to your houses and hide and get away from me. I want to say to you, Jesus 
understands what you're going through. And you say, why in the world would this be the will of God for my life? I want to challenge something in your heart this morning that the Lord put on my heart. There's so much that we're looking for in God that has nothing to do with His will. It has everything to do with the American dream. And we don't need to get the two confused with each other. The American dream is I've got to have a better job with better pay, better benefits, a better boss. Hello? The American dream is, man, I tell you, there's going to come a time when I'm going to be able to get that house or, or move to the lake, or get that boat, and the Lord would want me to, I don't know why the Lord hadn't given that to me, he says he owned the cattle on a thousand hills, why don't I have that new whatever it is, well that is not will of God, that's the will of America, and we need to understand the difference, so to help you, I'm going to give you three passages about, because I think a lot of us are wondering why God hasn't given us the American dream, thinking that's his will, when the will of God, according to Scripture, look at, at Romans 12, 2. It'll be on the screen. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What that says is, you've got to let the American dream go. Hello? Some of us are looking for peace in our career, and all we're doing is trading grass for turf. And we don't know that, that everywhere you go, you're going to deal with problems. Everywhere you go, there's that person that steals your coffee. Everywhere you go, there's that person that takes your favorite candy before you get there. Everywhere you go, you see what I'm saying? No matter where you move, no matter what school you put your kids in, hallelujah, they're going to deal with drama. It's going to happen. Some of you pay a lot of money for them to do it. Some of us get it for free. So you're just going to deal with stuff. You're going to deal with it everywhere you go. So he says, don't be conformed to what this world says is important. That's important for you because a lot of us don't have peace and we feel like God's left us out. I've been there because things haven't worked out the way I thought they should. Hello? He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, it's a test. He says, by testing... You may discern what, uh-oh, the will of God is. What is good and acceptable and perfect. God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. But he says, you're not going to know my will if you don't transform the way you think. Hello? Do you see that in Scripture? Am I lying to you? Is that what it says? Do not be conformed, but be transformed. If you don't transform and you stay conformed, you'll never know God's will for your life. Do you see that in that scripture? Okay, I'm just making sure before we move on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. I'm exposing some stuff this morning to help you have some peace. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. All right? So he says here, Listen, wherever you're walking right now in this moment, you know where you're walking. He says, rejoice in it. Be joyful in it. Say, God, thank you for where I'm walking. That doesn't make much sense. You don't know where I'm walking. Well, pray about it. Don't stop praying about it. And give thanks in whew, all circumstances. How many of you are facing some sorry circumstances? Raise your hand. Yeah. I'm facing some. I hate weed allergy. You know how hard it is to have a weed allergy at Christmas when everybody's eating chocolate. You can't have this. No, I can't. But I can deck you while you eat it. <laughs> the only divinity for the rest of my life is the Lord. Not candy. It's tough. You say, well, my life has tougher things. Mine does too. But I want you to see here what he says. The will of God is to walk with God and let him handle your circumstances. That's the only way this works. Rejoice always. Pray without See, Stay connected to Christ. What it says, abide in Christ. John chapter 15. 
walk with him. Everybody's looking outside of Jesus Christ for what America can do for them. When he says, you abide in me and I'll make everything better for you. You just got to trust me. It may take some time, but abide in me and you will see my will. One chapter before that, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4, it says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And for the Thessalonian church, he said, here's a good example that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body with holiness and honor. So he says, listen, the will of God has nothing to do with your position. It has nothing to do with your geography. No. All of that is at fruit from the root. The root is the will of God. We have fruit that comes out from the will of God. He says, listen, it is your sanctification. And you say, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. To sanctify is to literally set apart for a particular use in a special purpose or work to make holy and sacred. The whole goal of God is not that you have everything on this earth that you want. Don't listen to TBN. A lot of those guys are heretics. Now, I know that may hurt your feelings. I got friends that I even like some of the things some of the people say on that station. But anybody that says God's will for you is to give you more stuff in this world, you need to read your Bible. That ain't got anything to do with God's will. God's will is to make you great in this world outside of your stuff. To allow His Holy Spirit to do great things in and through you for His glory, not yours. That's what it's all about. And it's so much more fulfilling. So much more fulfilling. I promise you that. May not feel like it right now, but what God's special purpose is for you is that you be holy. Set apart that you be like Jesus, period. That's his will for you. So when you're making a decision about your career, and some of you are doing that, some of you young folks, you're doing that, your answer should not be what is best for me. I'm about to set you free. You ready? It is how will God be most glorified? Where can I make the biggest difference for Jesus Christ? Where is the opportunity that best uses my gifts and talents for his glory? And that's how you make your decision. Some of you down here that are getting ready to go to college, you're like, well, what's my major going to be? What am I going to do when I work? Let it be how God has created you. He's created you with a purpose. Don't fight it. The things that you love, man, that's what he's put those passions inside of you. You need to become that person. Whatever that is. And you're going to have to root out a lot of things that the world tells you you need to be for you to discover who God has created you to be. But it's only in that place that you're going to be able to find true peace. Ask a ton of us out here that tried to do what the world told us to do. Get the degree they tell us to get. Go to the school they tell us to go to. And yet we graduate with a bunch of debt. Some people did it yesterday. With a bunch of debt. And the only thing ahead of us is bills and jobs. So you might as well get it right on the front end instead of on the back end. How is this going to bring me closer to Jesus Christ? And one thing I'll tell you that I've learned through the years is sometimes the hardest assignment is exactly where he wants you to be. Because it's the only way you'll completely depend on him. Can I get an amen? The hardest assignment. Man, how many of us have prayed, oh God, deliver me. He said, I delivered you right where I wanted you. Now suck it up and do what I told you to do. That is not the answer I was looking for, right? But it is the one that as you look back on life, it has done the most for your good. If you didn't fight him and you abide in him. You may have peace in the will of God. You may have peace in the word of God. You may have peace in the word of God. Look at what he says here. He says it here in the first of 33. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Jesus is saying things that are going to be quoted in God's word so that we may have peace. 
Where does our peace come from? Well, it comes from Jesus. Well, who is Jesus to us, and how do we continue to have this peace? How can we have peace from the Word of God? Well, you remember John 1, 1 and 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That's Jesus and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word of God. So I was having a conversation with someone this week, and he said, Well, I don't take the Bible literally. Only the stuff about Jesus. I said, man, that is great news. That is great news. Because I said, uh, if you don't take the Bible literally, but only stuff about Jesus, you don't have a problem with Matthew 5 through 7, right? Because that's Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. Don't have a problem with that at all. I said, you might want to read it before you say that. Right? Because, I mean, Matthew 5 through 7, it's pretty tough how Jesus views things. Then I said, you know, this guy had an issue about marriage and all kinds of stuff. And, and I just said, uh, man, you might want to look over there a little further in Matthew to see what, what Jesus defines that as. And, and I said, and by the way, whatever you do, don't, don't read John chapter 1 because John chapter 1 says that Jesus is the word. So the part you're not taking literally is Jesus. So you're literally not taking Jesus seriously when you read his word. He didn't reply. I hope God used it. Because I'm telling you, we want to read the stuff we like. And it's why some of us don't read the Bible. Some of us don't read the Bible because we don't know that we don't have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We made a decision, but it was not conversion. We're a church member, but we're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, it is great evidence that if you read the Bible and you don't get anything out of it, that you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because there's no way with the Holy Spirit of God, if you read the Bible, you're not going to get something out of it. He's not going to keep it from you. So you need to question your salvation and make sure that you're right with the Lord. Because he wants to speak to you. He's not the great bully in the sky. He wants you to know what he's saying. He wants you to be able to understand. Well, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 proves that. It says, all Scripture is breathed out by God, all of it, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God, it could be woman of God right there, may be complete and equipped for every good work. What does he say? He says it's profitable, but it's only profitable if we... Read it. Use it. He says, listen, there's four things that this stuff can do for you. This book right here can do a lot for you. It can teach you, right? It can teach you how to live. It can reproof. What what that means is it can can bring you back in line with what Scripture. Is that really what I believe? You read it and you say, that is what I believe. That's what the Word says, so that's what I believe. That's what reproof is. It proves again to you. The promises of God. It's, it's important for correction. There's not a time. Listen, I'm, I'm your pastor. There's not a time I don't read this word that God doesn't convict me and say, Aaron, there's some, there's some attitudes and actions you need to work on. Amen? And people say, well, why in the world would you want to read something that makes you feel bad? Man, it sets me free. Because I know. I know. I'll never forget. In the seventh grade. I cheated on a math quiz. I'm coming clean today. (laughs) I really did it, Mama. And it was the craziest thing that I could have done because I had Mr. Wilburn. Mr. Wilburn was an old school teacher. And he said, Mr. Dickinson, come out in this hallway so we can have a board meeting. Kids, y'all may not know this, but back in our day, when they said we're having a board meeting, it wasn't the kind of meeting, you know, committee meeting where we're comparing notes. It's a board on the boote. <laughs> Mr. Wilburn, I'll never forget as long as I live, because I was spoiled. My mama didn't really, she didn't really spank me. One time she did, because I was real, I really deserved it. It was long overdue, and I told her I was going to call child abuse. I didn't know the number, but I was going to call them. I was spoiled rotten, but Mr. Wilburn was going to take care of that. 
And on the third lick, he broke the board on my rear end, and it went flying down. The, I thought I was going to pass out. Have y'all ever been, have y'all ever gotten a licking like that? Well, your rear end goes numb on the first one, so you don't really feel the second two. Anybody? Well, people say all kinds of things about that. There's all kinds of research out there now that that just kills kids' self-esteem. I'll tell you what it did for me. It kept my eyes on my paper for quizzes for the next seven years. That's what it did for me. There were times I wanted to cheat in geometry in high school. And when I did, I don't know about you, but in that moment, in that desk, I felt that tremor in my right butt cheek. And I knew correction is good. Corrections because Mr. Wilburn loved me. He saw something in me that he didn't want me to take the easy way out. Amen? Teachers don't do that kind of stuff, give you zeros, because you, people today, they get zeros and they think it's the teacher's fault they got a zero. Did you cheat? Yes, but I don't deserve a zero. Did you do any of the work yourself? No. Well, that's what zero is, but I don't deserve a zero. Well, what did you bring to the table that you needed to deserve something? Nothing. Well, that's exactly what you're getting, nothing. And the kid still leaves confused, and their parents come up and fight the teacher about it. Can I get an amen? And I'm thinking, that's what's wrong with us. The Word is there because God loves us, and He says, these are the things you don't do. Not so He can be a cosmic killjoy, but so He can protect your peace. You're not at peace when you're out there sinning and doing the things you know you don't need to be doing. You know you're not if you're born again. So Matthew 5, 17 through 19, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law. That's the smallest, smallest little inkling of the Hebrew and the Greek languages. It says, until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes in one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So we've got to get off of this thing. Well, I don't think that part of the Bible applies anymore. Jesus says it does. Now, it's all under the grace of God now. And it's all about His commandments. We now live because of what Jesus Christ has done. We're able to love God and love our neighbor. But it's still active in us today. You may have peace in the will of God. You may have peace in the Word of God. God wants you to have peace. You'll have it as you get around His Word. And He reminds you of who He is. And third... You may have peace in the work of God. You may have peace in the work of God. What did God do? He sent his son Jesus to this earth. We talk about this time of season and a manger, but we know where he was going. And that was to the cross for you and for me. He says, listen, in the world you will, not you might, you can, you will have tribulation. So if you say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. Yep, all around this room, people do. It may not be the same, but tribulation is tribulation. In this world, you will have trials, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Can I get an amen? 1 John 5, 4 and 5. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. How do we do it? Our faith. It's by faith. By believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, ascended to heaven so that we have resurrection power. We can have forgiveness. We can have grace through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 Corinthians 15, 56, and 57 says, The sting of death is sin. It's not death. It's sin. So you're worried about death. The Bible says the, the real death is sin. And he says the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 34, 35, and 37. You heard me say it last week. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can get in between you and God's love? 
He says, shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No. No. In all these things. It's going to happen. He didn't say it wasn't going to happen, did he? He gave you a list there. He said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us. You may have peace in the will of God, the word of God, and the work of God. I want to ask you this morning, are you experiencing the peace of God? Are you experiencing the peace of God? Are you fighting his will for your life? I get it. But don't confuse the American dream with God's will. God's will is that you become more like Christ, and that hurts. Because it's saying no to a lot of the things this world says is important to you. But he wants, you'll know you're walking in his will, not when you get that dream job or that dream retirement. You know you're walking in his will when you have died to yourself and you live for his glory. Man. You know where to go, and that's to his word. And you've got to remind yourself of the work that Jesus Christ has done. So to help you this week, I want to give you some steps so that you can have peace. For the will of God, I want to challenge you. And I'm challenging myself. I'm putting a circle around myself, and I'm saying to you, I'm going to do the same thing. Accept where you are and work on who you are. Accept where you are and work on who you are. If you want to be in the will of God, accept where you are. And you can do that in this invitation time in just a few minutes. Lord, I accept it. And that's hard because as an American, you're like, no, I don't have to accept it. That's pride. Pride is sin. Say, God, I, I accept where, where I am because I know you're sovereign and you're in control of all things. And you don't put me in places that you can't work. So I accept that. So, Lord, I am accepting that right now as Swartz First Baptist Church on December 9, 2018. And I'm not going to stop there, Lord. I'm going to work on who I am in you. Because I know if I work on who I am in you, you may change my surroundings, or you may change me in my surroundings, but one of the two is going to happen, and I trust you. The will of God. The Word of God. All right, you ready for this one? I'm going to do this with you. Read one chapter of Mark every day. The book of Mark. Shortest gospel. Some of you say, I can't read. There's, there's audio books. Man, we live in the day of technology. You can even get that online. For some of you, this is important for free. Just Google. Google's my assistant. You ask Google. She'll help you. And you just say, I need an audio book of Mark. There'll probably be 15 million that'll come up. Read one chapter of Mark each day. Now, if you do it every day starting today, you will finish Christmas Eve. All right? But if you're one of those people that likes your weekends, I've got a plan for you too. If you want to just go Monday through Friday from, to, from tomorrow to the end of the book, you will finish New Year's Eve. So it just depends on whether you want to finish Christmas Eve or you want to finish New Year's Eve. But I want you to finish this book of the Bible before the New Year. And then you can say, hey, I've read a book of the Bible. I've got myself ready for 2019. I've read the work of Jesus Christ. Christmas means more to me. The New Year means more to me. I triple dog dare you to join me in doing it. Every age group in here, read a chapter of Mark starting today or tomorrow, depending on when you want to finish. And the work is this. Who needs Christmas? We all do. The work is to remember what Jesus Christ has done. When Jesus looked at Nicodemus in John 3, 16, and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that if you would believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. You can have the peace of God and the work of God just knowing that Jesus Christ made a way for you to have forgiveness and grace and mercy. The greatest gifts that could ever be given. Better than any gift at Christmas. 
remember Jesus. Father, today, all across this room, we need you. Lord, we need your peace. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus didn't wait on the right circumstances to go to the cross. He told everybody, you're all going to leave me, but I'm still going to fulfill what God's called me to do. Lord, we can find peace in your will, which is to become more like you. Father, we can find peace in your word. Lord, I pray all across this room we're making commitments to start with Mark chapter 1 and to go through the entire book of Mark. And just get around your word and see what, Jesus, you have done for us. So that this season won't just be about what America says it needs to be. But it will truly be about the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not only on the cross, but in my life. And Lord, I pray for the one that's here today that, that maybe needed to hear. Maybe hearing it for the first time. That Jesus Christ came as the only Son of God. And he died on the cross for your sins in your place. He did for you what you could not do for yourself. He was a perfect sacrifice. Tempted in every way that you are, but never sinned. Oh, he's felt your pain. He knows where you're at. He's written you a love letter. It's called the Bible. But in this moment, you know... That you need to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. You need to be saved. Saved from the life that, that you thought was headed in the right way. But you, you don't have peace. Listen, there's no way to have peace if Jesus is not your peace. He says, I am your peace. So you have a crossroads today where you're either choosing. Am I going to continue to just try it a little bit longer my way? Or am I going to listen to the voice of God who is convicting me and I am going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, come in and save me. Be the Lord of my life today and every day. Is that you? Do you need to be saved today? Listen, you're surrounded by people all around this room that have made that commitment to follow Christ, to hear his voice. What is God saying to you today? Is today the day of your salvation? Is today the day that you enter into a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ? You come. Let Wesley or I know we would love to pray with you. And love to, to help you get on the road to walking with God in your life. Maybe you're here today and you haven't had peace. But man, this, this message has resonated with you. And it could be in a million different ways may not even be in a way that I shared. And you just need to mark it down. Today on December the 9th, I put a marker down at the altar of the church at Swartz First Baptist that I was not going to fight the will of God. I was going to get into the Word of God and I was going to remind myself every day of the work of God to give me His peace. Maybe you need to come to this altar and say, Thank you, God, for being my peace. Help me to live every day, every day in that peace that comes from you. I don't know what decision is on your heart, but I know God is ready to receive you. Won't you come? Lord Jesus, you already know what you marked out to do this day. So Lord, we welcome your presence here. Change a heart today change a mind today sets one of my friends free in here today from their worry and their anxiety and God flood them through the power of your Holy Spirit with your peace that passes all understanding let them know you are here and God you're changing lives I pray for the one that needs to make Jesus Lord of their life today needs to be saved God Speak clearly to them that they may receive you, I pray in Jesus' name. Will you stand with me? As God leads you, you come.